We are on page 850 in your Bibles in the pews this morning, Luke chapter 17, talking about the power of gratitude, continuing our series this morning from broken to blessed. And we are Luke chapter 17, page 850 in your uh, Bibles there in the pew. If you're on some kind of a device, we are using the new international version. Dr. Luke says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this? Underline this in your Bibles, foreigner. Then he said to them, Tim, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. And let's pray. Father, we're thankful for this morning. We're thankful for the rain. We're thankful for uh, this building that we can come and meet in and be dry. We're thankful this morning that we can be together in this place in freedom to be able to worship you. God, sometimes we're just not grateful enough. And so I pray this morning as we understand this key ingredient to moving from brokenness to bless, that you will help us to really understand what it means to tap into the power of gratitude. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. I grew up in a house that my dad had decided to build, and it was sort of a deep house, but when you looked at it up front, it was really, you know, it looked uh, kind of small from the front, but it went way back on this lot. Now, my dad had these grandiose plans in building this house that he was going to put uh, underground, like, pools and bridges going over inside the house and all this kind of stuff, and basically what we got to was when you walked in the double front doors, there was like a garden, a Spanish-type garden, and then there was glass sliding doors that came together. And I remember as we were always opening and closing those doors and they were, I still remember it was like they were like, they had to work at it, you know, to open these doors. Well, I remember one day as a kid, I went to the door to open it and I pulled it just, you had to put your hands in like this to pull it. And when I pulled it, the door went. And cracked. And so I went right into my mom and I said, Mom, I, I want you to know that I, no I didn't, I ran. <laughs> I ran and I hid in the closet. And they were looking for me and they're calling for me. I'm like, uh, finally I, I came out because I thought they were really going to be mad. And honestly, I hadn't thrown anything. It was just a freak accident, which my, da my dad said later, you know, the doors were old and it was a freak accident. And don't worry about it. The problem was is they couldn't afford for a while to get that glass sliding door replaced because it was really, really expensive. And so every time we sat in the living room, we saw that cracked glass. And it was like, ugh. Life is like that, isn't it? You ever had something that has cracked in your life? Where it's cracked and you, and you can't, no matter what you try to do, you can't unsee it. It always seems to be there. There's, there's something that was broken and maybe it was a, a broken relationship. Maybe it was a, a broken career. Maybe it was a broken past. Maybe it was something that was broken with your parents. Maybe it was a, a broken childhood. It could have been broken trust. I mean, when you think about all of the brokenness that there is in the world, there's a lot of it. We are a broken world. And if you don't believe it, just go on social media. Everybody seems to be broken. And now our politics are broken. Our, our churches are broken. Our church leaders are broken. Our, I mean, it is amazing the brokenness that we are surrounded with. You can't, you can't open up your email. You can't open up Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or something without seeing the fact that people are broken broken and they're hurting and it's like what do we do to get out of this I want you to think about the most broken time thus far that you've had in your life 
Aren't you glad you came to church? It was not dreary enough outside this morning. Now isn't it worse? When you think about the most broken thing that actually happened to you, and I literally want you to hold on to it for a second. And I, I can't even talk about it without choking up. Where you just <coughs> felt broken. It hurts. And so when you come from that place of brokenness, it's like, how in the world can you talk about being blessed? How in the world can you talk about with what, what happened to you? Maybe what was done to you or what you did to somebody else. You think about how in the world can I go from a place of brokenness to blessed? And what in the world can I do? It's hard. But it's not impossible. I want to just for a moment, move you from that place of brokenness back to neutral and tell you a story. A story that we've actually already read this morning that really is going to show us the power of what we need to do from move, for, to move from this place of brokenness to at least being blessed. Now, you read the story with me. It's the story of the ten lepers. But I think that often if we've read scriptures over and over again, sometimes they become familiar. And, and that in that familiarity, we don't see necessarily see things that really happen in there. Now, I want to go back and read the story again. But let's make some commentary. And then we're going to wrap it up and talk about really the power of gratitude in our lives. So here it is. Notice what it says here. And I think we missed this. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled on the border between Samaria and Galilee. Jesus was like this. He's like straddling the fence, you know, between the bad section of town that you didn't go in and the okay section of town. Between the people that you didn't associate with and the people that were his peeps. You know, if he got his DNA test back, Jesus was walking with his peeps. But he also was walking with the peeps that weren't his. And so that was pretty typical, but he's kind of like, you know, going between Samaria. And if you know anything about Samaria, you know, the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. And often people were rebuking Jesus and going, why are you talking to these people? They're not our people. They're not the same DNA as we are. They're not the same social people that we are. They're kind of foreigners. They're over there. So why are you talking to these people? And constantly, Jesus was criticized by his own disciples and by the Pharisees and the religious leaders for saying, why are you associating with these people? So Jesus has got, got them walking with him. And I kind of think they're probably thinking, oh, why are we here again? You know, I'm sure some of his followers are. And so here we go. And as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. Now, leprosy, let's stop there for a moment. A lot of times in New Testament times, you know, we think of the term leprosy and, and, and what it means and what we used to think it was then. And, you know, they used to think that it was something that you could catch a skin disease. It was actually, you could catch at the time. And it literally may have been. Leprosy was an overall sort of skin condition that they felt was contagious. And so because of that, in case you didn't know this, what had to happen according to the law and according to the culture is that they had to stay at a distance from people. And when people got very close to them, they would have to say, unclean. Do you imagine that? But it's really the equivalent. It's the equivalent of us, if you've ever, and I've done hospital visits, and I always love, you know, I don't mind going and seeing you all in the hospital, but when they put you in quarantine, I'm worried. I'm just telling you. You know, like, oh, you got to go, and, oh, man, okay, I got to put the mask on and, you know, and put the gloves on, and I'm like, hi, you know, from a distance. You know, it's, it's kind of like that. But what they had to do was they had to say, unclean. Because they, they didn't want anybody to catch this. Now, often what happened with these lepers is they lived in what we call leper colonies. They had to go off to themselves. Sometimes they lived in caves. Sometimes they lived in, in different places outside of the town. And they had to really depend on each other for support. They were societal, religious, political, social. You, get, you imagine any possible kind of outcast. Nobody wanted to be around them. They just had to be around themselves. They were all one group of outcasts, of hurting people that were huddled together. And so they probably traveled with each other for support. So 10 of them come together and they, they come to Jesus and it says he's going to the village. 10 men who had leprosy met him. Notice what it says next. They did what? They stood at a distance. They kept their distance from Jesus. But 
they called out, now underline this, in a loud voice. They called out in a loud voice. Rather than saying, unclean, they yelled out to Jesus and said, Master, have pity on us. Wow. Can, Jesus, can you please do something? We're, we're separated from our family. I haven't seen my mom. I haven't seen my dad. I haven't seen my, my wife. I haven't seen my children. And we've heard tell that you've... Actually, Mark gives an account where Jesus, when a leper said to him, you can heal me. And the Bible says Jesus reached out and touched the leper. Touched him. Nobody did that and was healed. So they knew. So we're a little, a little while along the story. So they knew that he could do something. So they start yelling. And you can imagine from this place of absolute pain and brokenness of being separated and away and outcast. And nobody wanted to be around them. And anytime they got close to normal people, people that were not diseased, people that were not broken, that they had to yell, we're unclean, stay away. That they said, please have, have pity on us. Now, Jesus could have done a number of things. Now, there's some, there's some language questions on how what's translated here. So the NIV, kind of in, in the newer uh, versions, kind of went past it. One, one translation said Jesus was indignant. Bad translation. Literally, the idea is in some of the other manuscripts, it says he was moved with compassion, which is what would happen to him. So it says when he saw them, notice what he says to them. Go show yourselves to the priest. Whoa, whoa, time out. He, he didn't say... You're healed. He didn't anoint them with oil. And what was cool was he didn't, he didn't give them a lecture on leprosy. He didn't talk about the theology of it. Nor did they, by the way. None of them were going, oh, how come we're like this? They just said, have pity on us. They didn't go, how come we got leprosy? And what do we do? And how come we're not uh, clean like everybody else? And how? They didn't do any of that. It was, have pity on us. And it, so, so Jesus, rather than saying, you're healed, rather than coming over and embracing them and touching them, rather than doing that, he goes, go show yourself to the priest. Now, time out. That was an after step. See, the priests had to declare them clean so they could be moved back into society. But in the midst of their leprosy, in the midst of the brokenness, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the isolation, he doesn't say to them, you're healed. He said, I want you to go show yourself to the priest. Now, let me tell you what I think is cool about this. They didn't argue the theology of it. They could have, they, I, I would have been, um, excuse me, Jesus, I, I just got a quick question. Um, we're not, so, right now I got leprosy. And you want me to go show myself to the priest, but I got leprosy. And so the priest is not going to declare me clean. So Jesus, I'm going to be in the same spot that I was in when I came to you in the first place. So why is it happening like this? I would have had a few questions. Nope. Notice what it says happen. He says to them, Go, show yourself to the priest, and without discussion, without qualification, without asking any questions, without arguing the theology about it, notice what it said, and as they went, they were cleansed. Best translation. Some translations have it that when they got to the priest, they were cleansed. It's not what it says. As they were going on their way, so as they turned and Jesus said, I want you to go, they started to walk. Now, can you imagine the discussion that was going on? You know, they're walking, they're talking, maybe there's some discussion going on about going to the priest and old Joe looks over at Steve and goes, your skin's looking a little better. And Steve looks down and goes, and he can see this starting to clear up. And all of a sudden, they start to look at one another. And it's gone. It's gone. Completely. I can't imagine what their reaction was at that moment. We're healed. We're no 
longer outcast. I can, I can imagine them running to the priest to go, quick, tell me that I'm clean. Declare me clean. I can go home. I can be a part again. I can, I can have, I can have people embrace me. I can be touched. I, I can, I can feel like I'm connected again. Can you imagine the discussion? They were cleansed. One of them saw he was healed. And it says he came back. Now, notice this. Praising God in a what? In a loud voice. Remember back up in uh, verse uh, 12, verse 13, they called out in a what? A loud voice. This, this guy is praising God as loud as he was when he was declaring that he was unclean. He's now declaring, God has healed me as loud as he possibly can. Rather than yelling unclean, he's running to Jesus and he's yelling and he's praising God and he's jumping up and down and he's probably saying, I'm clean, I'm clean, I'm clean. And notice what it says he did as he gets here. It says he literally threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And then I love what Luke says. And he was a Samaritan. Wait a minute. The S word keeps coming up in Jesus' life. He was a Samaritan. The implication is that the rest of them weren't. You know, sometimes the things that divide us unite us in our brokenness. You ever notice that? The people that you normally would not maybe associate with or be with, that suddenly when you have something in common with them, that you are broken in the same way that you have been broken by the same manner, that you suddenly feel connected to them. And so here is a Samaritan with these religious Jews, and they're on their way to show themselves to the priest, and the Samaritan sees that he's healed, and he literally stops. He changes direction. He turns around, and he starts yelling as he sees Jesus, and he's praising God, and he throws himself at Jesus' feet and he did what? He thanked him. And Luke says he was a Samaritan. But, but the, the, the Jews had no dealing with the Samaritans. It was, it was a story of the good what? The Good Samaritan, because when you re remember the story, the story was a poignant one, because here was a guy that had beaten and was beaten and bloodied and bruised by robbers, was left for half dead, and you have the religious people and the religious leaders from the synagogue who are on their way to church, and so they see the guy laying there, and because they don't want to be what? Unclean, they don't touch the guy. Twice. Two religious people go by, and it's a Samaritan who sees the Jew laying on the ground, and he picks him up, and he binds his wounds, and he puts him on his own animal, and he takes him to the end, and he stays with him overnight, and he takes care of him, and once he finds out he's out of the woods, the next morning, he goes to the innkeeper and says, look, I'll come back, and here's, here's what I, and, and, and let me give you more money, just in case he needs to stay here longer, but make sure he's taking, he's taking care of them, and then Jesus looks at the Jewish lawyer and says to him, which one was the neighbor. So he does it again here. And the Samaritan thanks him. Now I want you to see what happens next. Because if I were Jesus, let me tell you what I would have done. I would have cursed the other nine with leprosy again. Oh, you're the only one who came back? Guess what? You guys got it again. That's it. Right? Don't you feel like that a little bit like, man? Because how many times have you done something for somebody and they've been ungrateful and you think, oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Right? Mm. <laughs> Jesus asked, look at this. Were not all ten cleansed? It's, just watch that. 
all of them were cleansed. All of them were healed. And it's a good thing that I'm not Jesus because those nine would have went down having leprosy, but the other nine didn't. They were all cleansed. But he says this. He's looking around and he's trying to teach them a lesson. He goes, where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God? Watch this. Accept this <clears throat> foreigner. It took the one who is a traditionally unbeliever, who traditionally worship other, worships other gods, who you all don't normally like to be around in the religious establishment. You mean it's this foreigner, this outcast is the only one that, in, that was still healed that actually came back and praised God? <laughs> that he said to him, I love this, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Now they all had faith, didn't they? When you think about it, they all had faith because when Jesus said to them, go show yourself to the priest, they all turned around and went to the priest. Without question, without argument, without saying, Jesus, but wait a minute, this isn't actually how it works. There's a couple of other steps in between. None, they, they all had faith. But one came back grateful. And the way this reads is that basically your faith because of your gratitude, your faith that your faith because of this gratitude that you have has changed your life. Because let me just say this to you. You can be cured of whatever the brokenness is that you have. And the brokenness can be removed and you can still be living in it. Let me just say that again. The thing that caused your brokenness could be gone. You could have moved on from it but you can still be living in the brokenness. There has been so much lately about victims from the Me Too movement, from all the different things that are going on. And I, and I want to say something. I want to say this very, very carefully. You can be victimized, and a lot of people are, and it's horrible what has happened. But you don't have to continue to be a victim. Let me just say that again. You can be victimized, but you don't have to continue to be a victim. You can be broken, but you don't have to continue to live in the brokenness. Now, let me tell you what the key is. The key is what happened with the 10th leper, the one that came back. Here it is. It's gratitude. You go, that's it? Yes. Gratitude is the gateway to move us from being broken to bless. Being able to be grateful for where we are in our lives at this moment. Here's the problem. You and I can be grateful even in the midst of brokenness. That's what's, what's so hard for folks. There, there are people, and we were talking beforehand about, about church. I figured, you know what, There's, the rain is going to keep some people home today. Thank God you're not living with some of our missionaries in foreign countries where, where they will have to go five miles on a bicycle, if they're lucky, to get there to church for four hours where they don't have a guitar, drums, a piano, an organ, or anything, and they don't have any screens, and they're singing, and they're joyful, and they're thankful that they have a place to even come and meet. We, it starts raining, we're like, oh, I'm wet. Oh, so wet today. Our default font for our lives, the default font for our lives is what's wrong. 
The default font is, yeah, but. You don't know where I was born. Yeah, but. You don't know what happened to me. Yeah, but. You don't, you're exactly right. I don't. I don't have any idea. Yeah, but. You were born white. Exactly. Yeah, but. There are all these yeah buts, but you and I can be thankful for where we are. Because I'm going to tell you what, as we said so often, where there's no conflict, there's no story. The only thing that ever makes a story is conflict. The only thing that ever will, will, will make a story, whether it's a drama that will keep you going for seven years watching a, you know, watching a series on, on television, or keep you going through a novel, is it's the conflict that the hero is in and how they wind up seeking to overcome that conflict and they and they wind up succeeding in the end. And usually the hero is put in an awful pickle. Maybe they were born in the wrong place, to the wrong parents, on the wrong side of the track. Maybe, maybe they were abused, they were marginalized, they were broken, and all of a sudden something beautiful happens. And that's what God wants to do in our lives. And so he says, what I want you to do is I want you to just be grateful for where you are at this moment. We have so much right where we're at today to be grateful for. So I want you to do something which is going to be really, really hard. Maybe, maybe not. For about two minutes, and it's going to be dead quiet in here when you do it. There are notes in front of you in the pew if you're not using them. And I just want you real quick to write down three things that you're grateful for. Now, wait a minute. Don't, if, you're, if you're a husband here and you got your wife, don't put, I'm grateful for my wife. Okay. Let's be specific. You know, I'm grateful for my, you know, no, it, something specific. Three things specifically that you're grateful for. I'm going to give you about two minutes to do it. I'm sorry I don't have music. I mean, I could go do, 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 but I won't do that. We'll just let you write three things, three things down that you're grateful for. Three things. Three things that you're grateful for right now today. Originally, I was going to actually uh, ask you to share that with somebody, but I'm not going to do that. But if there's, if there's somebody in your life that you wrote down something that you're thankful for for them, I want you to tell them that today. You know, if it's something that you're thankful for to God for, make sure that you tell him. Now, let me, let me get your attention back up here because I want to, want to you know, sometimes when we're talking about this stuff, that gratefulness is, you know, oh, well, you know, you got to talk about that. It's a, it's a spiritual thing. And, and, you know, God says in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And we see these whole things about gratitude and we talk about it. Well, here's the thing. Sometimes science catches up with the Bible. There is a, an article, and I'm not going to read it to you. There are, it's seven pages, so if you want the link, I'll put the link up, or have the link put up. Now, are you ready? Listen to this. How gratitude changes your brain. Gratitude actually creates new neural paths in your brain and changes how you think. Science has discovered this. Now, here's what a couple of things they said. Gratitude, listen to this. The first thing they discovered was gratitude unshackles us, are you ready, from toxic emotions. You know, complaining, whining, griping, kind of like, you know, when the Israelites, how come you brought us out here to die? It was better in the past. Oh, we were so much better in slavery. Gratitude will unshackle us from toxic emotions. Listen, so further, they got gratitude helps even if you don't share it. Even if just, just for you, you're grateful. Gratitude, it's going to take time. I love this one. Gratitude has lasting effects on the brain. 
lasting effects. And I, and they go into so much, I'm not even going to, I'm not going to read it, but they talk about the cerebral cortex and all of the things that happen with it. Let me just, let me just say something. The reason why God told us to be thankful was because he already knew that gratitude is as much for you as it, more for you than it is for him. It's more for you than it is for the other person that you express it to. Gratitude is the gateway for growth. Gratitude is the gateway to free you up to make radical and massive changes in your life. It's going to take time like anything else. The three things that you wrote down today, I would encourage you to write down three things just for the rest of the week. Get up first thing, write down three things that you're grateful for. And sit there until you can think of them, even if they're minor. It's like when I've challenged people to write out a list of 101 things you're grateful for. You start to repeat yourself after about 20. Then all of a sudden your brain frees up and you start to think about all the things that you've taken for granted. That's why when people go on mission trips and stuff, you go to another country and you're there on a mission trip and you go, man, I really am taking for granted the fact that we have running water. That I can go back to the bathroom and I can flush the toilet. That I can turn the faucet on and have water. That, yeah, it's ice cold in here right now. But the fact that we're not sitting here, you know, fanning ourselves and, and, and having to worry about the rain coming in on us that's going on outside. And we're, we're sitting here and we have microphones and this is going to go up on the internet later. And that we can greet one another and there's coffee in the back. There's all of this stuff that we have that sometimes we just simply aren't grateful for. Grateful that we have live music. Grateful that, grateful that we can sit in these pews. Grateful that we can get to church. Grateful that we have maybe transportation to church. Because even if you don't drive, you could probably get on the bus. Or you may have a bicycle. Or there's things called Uber. On and on and on it goes. We're grateful because we can get here. Gratefulness is the gateway to moving from broken to blessed. Because what happens is, is that we know we're broken. See, now I hope you're feeling better because I started you out feeling really, really bad. But we're ending it with you being really, really grateful. And if you really did that, I bet you your mood changed from where I put you down at the very bottom in the beginning to now you're ending where you're grateful. And that is the difference that gratefulness will make in your day, in your life, in your relationships. And that's why Jesus looked at this one guy and said, you know what? This praising God, coming back, this gratefulness has changed your life. You want to move from broken to blessed? Gratitude is a gateway. Let's pray. God, we...